Good evening. I'm Nina Zaneri, Executive Director of the Paul Revere Memorial Association. Welcome to this special reimagining of a little known but significant event that happened 250 years ago, March 5th, 1771. Paul Revere staged what the newspapers called a solemn and perpetual memorial on the first anniversary of the bloody massacre in King Street. He crafted a striking exhibition of three dramatic illustrations, the ghost of Christopher Sider, the Boston Massacre, and America as Lady Liberty, and displayed them in the windows of his North Square home. The scenes illuminated from behind for several hours that evening drew a crowd of many thousands. At 10 p.m., the display was withdrawn. Beyond the clear intent of keeping the memory of the prior year's assault on Boston citizenry alive, we have no record of Revere's actual thoughts about the event. No stranger to propaganda or protest, he was also a businessman with a large family to support, ever the promoter of his abilities as a silversmith, creator of illustrations and engraver. Might this have served as an advertisement for his craft? We're also deeply aware of the capacity of Paul Revere's legacy, both those aspects that are well known and those that are not known well at all, to help us consider how the past informs the present. So as we prepare to see once again this long ago illumination, it's interesting to consider what images you might place in the windows of your home to reinforce more current events. September 11th, the marathon bombing, George Floyd, the riot at the Capitol, or perhaps the pandemic itself. Who would you cast in the role of martyr or villain and why? Where is the line between fact, memory, and propaganda? Tonight, we're pleased to present what is to our knowledge, the first ever commemoration of this event with images crafted by R.P. Hale, followed by a panel of scholars discussing the art and history of this moment. Special thanks to the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati for its generous support of this program. So to begin, we take you back to 1771, a cold March evening, to Boston and Old North Square, and the home of the well-regarded artisan, Paul Revere. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Thomas Young. I have been a physician of this town Boston since 1765. We are here outside the dwelling place of my dear friend Paul Revere to view the illuminations in his windows upon the one year anniversary of two tragic events that happened in Boston in 1770. The first was the death of young Christopher Sider, a boy who attended a protest and was shot and mortally wounded by that vile customs informant, Ebenezer Richardson who fired into a crowd, thus murdering the poor boy. The second event occurred on March 5th following, in which soldiers of His Majesty's 29th Regiment of Foot fired upon a crowd of citizens of Boston outside of the Customs House, killing five and wounding others. It was decided that there should be a one-year anniversary of those terrible events. They would be commemorated by the tolling of church bells, by an oration that I gave earlier at the Manufactory Building, and by these illuminations of Paul Revere. As you come to visit these three panels, be reminded of the tragedy behind them solemnly. Think of the blood that was spilled and the death that was caused, all of this in the name of liberty. Boston, March 11th. Tuesday last was the anniversary of the never to be forgotten 5th of March, 1770, when Messrs. Gray, Maverick, Caldwell, Carr, and Attucks were inhumanely murdered by a party of soldiers of the 29th Regiment in King Street. The bells of the several congregational meeting houses were tolled from 12 o'clock at noon till one in the evening there was a very striking exhibition at the dwelling house of Mr. Paul Revere, fronting the Old North Square. At one of the chamber windows was the appearance of the ghost of the unfortunate young cider, with one of his fingers in the wound, endeavoring to stop the blood issuing therefrom. Near him 
his friends weeping. And at a small distance, a monumental obelisk with his bust in front. On the front of the pedestal were the names of those killed on the 5th of March. Underneath, the following lines. Cider's pale ghost, fresh bleeding stands, and vengeance for his death demands. In the next window were represented the soldiers, drawn up, firing at the people assembled before them, the dead on the ground, and the wounded falling, with the blood running in streams from their wounds, over which was wrote, foul play. In the third window was the figure of a woman, representing America, sitting on the stump of a tree, with a staff in her hand, and the cap of liberty on the top thereof one foot on the head of a grenadier lying prostrate, grasping a serpent, her finger pointing to the tragedy. The whole was so well executed that the spectators, which amounted to many thousands, were struck with solemn silence and their countenances covered with a melancholy gloom. At nine o'clock, the bells tolled a doleful peal until 10, when the exhibition was withdrawn and the people retired to their respective habitations. An oration containing a brief account of the massacre, of the imputations of treason and rebellion, with which the tools of power endeavored to brand the inhabitants, and a discant upon the nature of treasons, with some considerations on the threats of the British ministry to take away the Massachusetts Charter, was delivered on the evening by Dr. Young at the Factory Hall, being the place where the first effort of military tyranny was made within a few days after the troops arrived. Hello everyone, I am Robert Shimp, the Research and Adult Program Director for the Paul Revere Memorial Association. I am delighted today to welcome professors Serena Zabin and Nancy Siegel who are joining us to uh, add their expertise and context to uh, Paul Revere's illuminations on March 5th, 1771. Uh, we have an exciting uh, conversation uh, planned here um, this evening. So if you um, viewers at home have any questions as um, as we go through here and over the course of the, the, the talk, please feel free to put any questions you might have in the comments below and uh, myself or another staff member here at the uh, uh, Paul Revere House will, uh, will try to answer them for you. So before we get started, I want to introduce uh, both of our esteemed uh, panelists here. Uh, so first, Professor Serena Zabin is the Professor of History, uh, Broom Fellow for Public Scholarship, and the Chair of the History Department at Carrollton College. Uh, her most recent book, as you can imagine, one that has been uh, very popular uh, in these parts, is entitled The Boston Massacre, A Family History, and has received uh, many accolades over the, uh, over the past year, such as the Amazon Editor's Choice for History in 2020, the Journal of American Revolution Book of the Year Award, and was named to the Saturday Evening Post 10 Books for the New Year. She is continuing uh, with this research and some of the work that she did for this uh, project to develop a video game, Witness to the revolution. So we're very excited for that to come out. Uh, she's a recipient of numerous grants, including recently uh, being awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, uh, an American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship, and a fellowship to the Huntington Library. Uh, next, uh, Professor, uh, professor uh, Nancy Siegel is the Professor of Art History at Towson University and specializes in American Landscape Studies print culture and culinary history of the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, currently, she's completing the manuscript Political Appetites, Revolution, Taste, and Culinary Activism in the Early Republic. Most recently, she was a contributing scholar and registrar for the exhibition Beyond Midnight, Paul Revere, organized by the American Antiquarian Society, uh, which ran at the New York Historical Society, the Worcester Art Museum, and the Concord Museum. So Revere definitely has been on the mind recently for uh, Nancy. Uh, she's currently curating the international exhibition, Curious Taste, The Appeal of Transatlantic Satire, and amongst other texts has recently authored, edited the Cultured Canvas, New Perspectives on American Landscape Painting and Riverviews of the Hudson River School. 
So thank you both so much for being here on today, the 250th first anniversary of the massacre, and of course the 250th anniversary of Paul Revere's Illuminations commemorating the event. Thank you, nice to be here. Thank you so much for having us on. S so Serena, I wanted to, to start with, with you. Obviously, uh, written quite a bit and thought quite a bit about the massacre, uh, 1770. But I was wondering if you could maybe set the stage for us uh, thinking about Boston kind of post-massacre. So maybe that 1771 moment or the things uh, over the course of 1770 after the massacre that, that maybe led up to this moment for, for Revere. So I think as we think about what Boston was like in 1771, it's worth thinking about who we're talking about. So for, um, for people who are politically engaged, who are really paying attention to the trials, who are sons of liberty like Revere, um, or, you know, otherwise, you know, women who are part of that world also, right? And, and children and, um, actively politically engaged um, people of color, 1771 feels like kind of a disappointment. In fact, the um, the town meeting, you know, the first thing that they do in um, January of 1771 is complain about how they think the town of Boston looks to everyone else after accounts of the trial start to come out. And they're like, oh, we should do something about this, right? We need to look better. Um, and they start talking about what they're going to do. And actually nothing really ever happens, right? They never do much except maybe this moment, right? So for politically active people, 1771 is a moment where they're still trying to think, how can we make sure that Boston is actually winning the PR war about what happened in that shooting? I'd say, however, there are a lot of Bostonians who don't care that much about how their town looks in the eyes of the larger world. And there are some who do and still have other concerns, right? And, and we know about people who move back and forth between feeling really politically engaged and feeling not that politically engaged. And so for some of those Bostonians, not that much has changed. So local women continue to marry the soldiers who are still in town, actually half the marriages that happen between soldiers and civilians happen after the shooting in March of 1770. So um, they continue to ask, civilians continue to ask soldiers to act as godparents for their, um, for their children as they baptize them in the local churches. And so they continue to to socialize. And, and that's true actually of, you know, kind of wealthy elite men as much as it is of ordinary people. So on the one hand, you do have some concern. Oh, did we really get out the story we wanted to tell? And on the other hand, people are like, okay, we are, you know, continuing to live our lives. It's not yet a hugely political moment. And of course, with, with, thinking about how people even at that time were remembering and, and thinking about uh, the Boston massacre and some of that information, of course, uh, Nancy, I mean, Paul Revere was a, a major component of this, right? I mean, with certainly the engraving that, that came out afterwards, but but Revere himself in, in the moment that we're thinking about in 1771 puts out these illuminations. Um, but but of course, they didn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, Revere had, had been working as an artist, as an engraver for um, years before 1771. So I was wondering if maybe you could um, contextualize or put these illuminations into context for us, Nancy. We don't have any direct reproductions or representations of the illuminations themselves, but are there things that we can maybe draw on from Revere's history and career to, to put them in context? Sure, absolutely. And so while we don't have any visual evidence of what these illuminations look like, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that exists either from uh, newspaper accounts and also from some of his previous work. So I just wanted to very briefly, um, in the Massachusetts Spy, there was noted um, on Tuesday last, the anniversary of the Boston Massacre, at noon and after nine in the evening, all the bells in town tolled and at dark was exhibited in the chamber windows of Mr. Revere in the Old North Square, a set of transparent paintings. So it gives us our first clue. 
Now, the Connecticut Journal adds to this, and um, the descriptions are really quite vibrant. And so in the evening, there was a striking exhibition in the house of Mr. Paul Revere. At one of the chamber windows was the appearance of the ghost of Christopher Sider with one of his fingers in the wound, endeavoring to stop the blood issuing therefrom. Near him his friends weeping, at a small distance, a monumental pyramid, which the Massachusetts spy is going to call the monumental obelisk, and this becomes important a little bit, with the names of those killed on the 5th of March round the base. In the next window were represented the soldiers drawn up, firing at the people, assembled before them, the dead on the ground, and the wounded falling with the blood running in streams from their wounds, over which was wrote foul play. In the third window was the figure of a woman representing America, sitting on the stump of a tree with a staff in her hand and the cap of liberty on the top thereof, one foot on the head of a grenadier lying prostrate, her fingers pointing to the tragedy. So what we find in the newspapers is that each of those three windows has some relationship to earlier work that Revere had produced. So window number one looks like it copies in some measure the Bloody Massacre. And it's important to remember that the year before, when Revere has this image printed, it's widely disseminated. And it's one of his most um, important pieces of propaganda. So the fact that he resurfaces that imagery a year later, one, it would have been very well known. There were at least 25 copies and versions made of the Bloody Massacre and widely disseminated. Um, it might also have been a wonderful way for him to, to continue to promote people buying this engraving. Um, it was certainly um, available for sale the year after. Um, but it also references the idea of um, who he is as both an entrepreneur and also an artisan. So if Bloody Massacre is in window number one, in window number two, that reference to the obelisk goes back to work that he had done with the Sons of Liberty in 1766, in May. A public celebration was taking place and a large obelisk was made and placed in the center of town. Now, the only way we remember what that looks like is an engraving that Revere had made. And the imagery that's described in the newspaper sounds so much like the imagery that he had used in the obelisk as well especially window number three, where it makes reference to the figure of liberty. You can see that, especially on the fourth final side of images from the obelisk. So he appropriates a lot of imagery consistently. Um, even the imagery from the obelisk goes back to an earlier engraving that he makes um, called A View of the Year of 1765, which is in reference to the Stamp Act. So for Revere, this idea of reissuing and regenerating imagery for him is very much a part of his creative process. Right. And we see him involved, as, as you're saying, in these, these critical moments from 1765 to this moment in, in, in 71 is obviously a lot's happening, not just, you know, in, in the colonies, but in, in Boston in, in particular. And, you know, I think one of the things that, that has stood out to me for, for your work, um, Serena, is you often reference, um, or you, you have referenced the, the revolution and kind of this moment as, as, as a bad divorce, right? Uh, between uh, colonists and, 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 and Britain. So I, I guess putting that thought into context, um, I mean, with Revere's staking, I mean, this is his house, right? That he's using for, for these illuminations. I mean, what sort, of, what sort of messaging do you think Revere was sending from that? And I guess on, on, on top of that, is this something risky to be doing to be really highlighting your work from your your home with your family in the central location in Boston? So yeah, those are great questions. I think that um, maybe to take the second one first, the question of risk, I'd say, um, and I don't mean to hear underplay anyone's heroism, but I would guess is not high. Um, you know, this is before there's really clear sides of, you know, loyalist or Tory and, um, you know, Whig or Patriot, that language doesn't really exist in 71. Um, and you have a pretty weak 
governor and governor support, right? There's not a lot of people who are out there supporting the governor. Um, he's lost a number of rounds now. And um, it's clear that the Sons of Liberty um, definitely have a story they want to tell. And I do assume Revere is a part of that. So, um, you know, about the same time, I'll let Nancy speak about the, the visuals. Um, but it, the newspapers also print this piece of sort of wretched doggerel um, written by someone who's clearly, uh, I would guess, a young man and also um, sympathetic to the Sons of Liberty, where he talks about how um, other young men like himself shouldn't date women who have had anything to do with redcoats, right? He calls them redcoats leavings. Um, and he's really clear that in 71, there needs to be a line drawn between people who have had, um, you know, any kind of connection with soldiers and people who don't, right? Um, and he really wants to make that point. I think that many Bostonians are ignoring him Right. And um, my guess is that the Sons of Liberty are, you know, supporting Revere in this project, if not actually telling him to do it, because they've got a story they're trying to put out. And that story starts, you know, strangely in some ways with um, Christopher Slider. Right. And I mean, in fact, when he's killed, I, you know, 13 months before this, if I'm doing my math correctly, um, in February of 1770. He's not killed by a soldier, right? He's he's killed by a kind of hangers on of one of the customs, um, you know, of the the customs house, and um, the soldiers are very clearly staying out of it. They're like, this is a domestic problem, and we are not getting involved. And it's really the Sons of Liberty who collapse these um, conflicts together, right? And that's what you see happening in seventy one. Also. It, the story of Christopher Sider starts before then, but it's not actually a shooting done by the soldiers. Right. And I think, yeah, I, I think we see that so visually as you're, as you're saying, Nancy, I mean, this is one of the first times that we're seeing, I think maybe that the, the Sider reference, you know, visually like this um, from, from Revere's illumination. So, I mean, Nancy, what, what, what is your sense of, of these works from Revere works of, propaganda, I mean, their impact hitting hitting the mark, I guess you could say, um, from what Revere has been trying to do and what what some of the Sons of Liberty have been trying to do over these over these years. Yeah, absolutely. If I just reference that obelisk engraving from 1766, once again, the um, public display where the physical obelisk was shown, it was um, also made out of oil paper. So the transparencies that we're talking about for these illuminations at Revere's house this process, the physical process of how they were made, is something that Revere was already familiar with. And I should note that while there was that celebration in May of 66, there were other homes surrounding this celebration where people had these um, uh, oiled paper transparencies also illuminating their windows. So what Revere is doing in 71 is part of an artistic display that's well known. Um, the obelisk itself, which may have been made with some of the last uh, stamped paper in the colonies, um, it would have been available still, even though it was celebrating the repeal of the Stamp Act, that paper was still in town, um, was lit by 200 um, lamps. And so the newspaper account is that there was this wonderful fireworks display that was set off and there were fireworks on the top of the obelisk. And this was tremendous. And this was the end of the evening celebrations. And it ended at 11 o'clock and people dispersed peacefully. And this was important that it was a peaceful celebration. And then at one o'clock in the morning, the obelisk catches fire and it's summarily destroyed. So many people have thought, well, it must have just been lamps that hadn't been extinguished. But if we look at Revere's role, um, um, he was very familiar with artillery. He was familiar with these sort of incendiary devices. Um, so were other members of the Sons of Liberty. If somebody had noticed that a lamp hadn't been extinguished at 11 o'clock, wouldn't someone have made note of that? So I'm suggesting that, that the demise of the obelisk could have been twofold. It could have been somebody who came back 
hours later in the cover of Darkness, who had more loyalist leanings, um, which in 66, um, as Dr. Zabin had said, this isn't a word that really is part of general parlance, um, but may have um, destroyed the obelisk thusly, or it might have actually been a member of the Sons of Liberty who came back and as a demonstration against George III decided to set this on fire as well. So there's a lot of mystery around this, but it also suggests that um, there's great interest in these public demonstrations. And so when Revere moves forward and makes his bloody massacre, that for him, if we look at that image, the way it's portrayed, right, the story of what happens, the facts don't match. So this image text relationship, there's a real disjunction there. Um, Revere is doing this very specifically. It's very propagandistic. This is a political print. It's not a satire. It's not like uh, the farcical mocking prints that are coming over from England, for example, that are in sympathies with the colonies. This is a very direct and politically pointed statement. Um, now, of course, the imagery that Revere uses, um, he most likely uh, copies that from Henry Pelham. So, you know, that's another issue in terms of his own sense of originality. But there's a lot going on in that print to talk about why that visual distortion of how he presents that day, what message was important to get across in terms of garnering support. Absolutely. And I, I think to that point, might, might you, I, I mean, backtracking a bit in terms of what Revere put forward, I mean, what what is the uh the the propaganda versus the reality if you could maybe speak to that serena sure so um you know some of the propaganda pieces are pieces that i expect you know many of you know our audience knows well you know maybe most famously the renaming of um the customs houses butcher's hall right you know just um, you know, the complete lack of subtlety that we see there, right? And, but, you know, also all kinds of things around, you know, the gore around the well-dressed um, Bostonians looking very kind of middle-class and this line of soldiers leaning forward very aggressively with a, uh, um, Captain Preston, the commanding officer, standing very safely behind them, right, urging them on. And, um, you know, and most of all, perhaps, or, you know, we know, or we know the, that one woman um, in the middle, right, with her hands up to her chest, looking, you know, um, very anxious, but also, you know, indicating to the viewer that this is a group of, you know, very safe, men to be around, right? This is not some crazy mob. Um, this is a, a, you know, a group of, of well-dressed Bostonians. And then, you know, I think too, the biggest piece of the story that he wants us to take away is that there are soldiers on the one side of the street and civilians on the other, and this bright white light of um, line of gun smoke that's separating the two of them, which both actually and and figuratively, as I was saying about these marriages and baptisms, was simply not true. But part of the story that he and the other Sons of Liberty really wanted to tell was a story that said, you know, soldiers are the aggressors here and um, civilians are, you know, the unarmed victims. But more than that, um, this is a story of, you know, what happens when a, you know, group of soldiers just comes on in as strangers and just plows down all these people they don't even know, right? A whole set of strangers. And that's the piece that's really not true. Right. And I, I, I want to also ask about the, I mean, these, these interconnected webs, and you've, you've spoken to this so often and written so much about this. I mean, is this um, geographically speaking? I mean, I, 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 the Revere's are so connected to the, the North End itself and the house there. But I mean, do we see these webs throughout all of all of Boston, or is this a more you know localized uh, phenomenon through the through the town at that point? There are. I mean, the, it's it's everywhere. These these connections. So um, soldiers and their families, when when the army comes to Boston in 1768, um, they come with 
families with wives and with children. And um, they end up living, renting spaces from Bostonians all over the Shamak Peninsula, right? Um, so including absolutely in the North End. Um, and so those are networks of, of neighbors um, that everyone, including Revere, knew. And Revere himself had all kinds of social networks, especially through his work with the Masons, with the Freemasons, with, um, with soldiers and officers. Um, so this is not, you know, would, would not have been a surprise to him. This was a deliberate choice. Right. And I think one of the I mean, one of the things I think that often stands out to, you know, to visitors to the Revere House and and thinking about Revere's production. And certainly we're talking about the engravings here, but you know, his works of silver politics, even well through the well through 73, 74 politics never got in the way of business for Revere. I mean, he's selling both to to soldiers while they're there. He's selling to well-known Tories. So, you know, if 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 he could continue those connections, I think, as as you're saying, it just displays how tightly wound these these connections and even oppositional politics continued to be through 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 the period for sure. Yeah, and if I can just add, and this is what I mean when I say that the beginning of the revolution is like a divorce. I mean, for a long time, these people are interconnected. It's only later, it's only looking back that they retell these stories about how separate they were, right? But but in the course of living, they're all living together. Right, and for for the illuminations themselves, then too, and in, in, in terms of um, the community and 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 where Revere is situated here, and I wonder if maybe both of you could speak to this to some extent. I mean, to to what extent do we feel like this is something um, from his history and what we know about Boston at the time? Do we think that this is something Revere took on himself uh, to create? to make this political statement? Do we think that this is tapped into more of a larger network for um, for what's going on for the Sons of Liberty, for leadership in Boston, that maybe this is something uh, Revere was one way or another suggested to do from, from anything besides his own inspiration? Professor Siegel, you wanna start that one? <laughs> so I was gonna say from the, the perspective of visual culture, if we look at the ways that Bloody Massacre, for example, disseminated. So it wasn't just the singular print. It appeared in multiple newspapers. It appeared in almanacs. It even appeared on a powder horn that was carried into the Revolutionary War. So this was an image, this was a story, this was a narrative that traveled far and wide and it had lasting power. So it wasn't just that, you know, when Revere makes this print just three weeks after the event, it wasn't as if that contemporary reportage was just of the moment. This cast um, a story, um, a perspective that was meant to fuel um, sort of growing concern. And so I think about who would have had access to that image. So why would the illuminations be so popular, right? The newspapers tell us that thousands of people were there to see the illuminations, which is Remarkable when we think about the size, the, the population of Boston and people gathering in that in those numbers. So when Revere first published Bloody Massacre, it was sold by Edies and Gill for eight pence. And to give this a kind of context, we think about, well, what did that mean? So eight pence translates into a little over two pounds or about three dollars today. But what would eight pence get you? So for six pence, you could go to a barber and have your wig fixed and get a shave. Or you could buy two pounds of butter. Or you could buy four pounds of flour. So I like to situate this in terms of who is going to be spending their eight pence on this print by Revere? Are you buying flour that week or are you buying this image? And so we know that it disseminated to a vast group of, uh, in terms of the economic strata. If you didn't buy that print, you would still see it uh, reproduced in the newspapers or in those one of 25 variations. So I think for Revere, this is an image that went far and wide. The fact that he chose to include this a year later as one of those three scenes in the window, for him, it makes perfect sense that he's referencing 
that earlier work and also um, produces an image that people would be widely aware of. So, and just maybe adding on to that, I would hypothesize um, that he's doing this at least in conversation with the Sons of Liberty, that the, um, the illuminations so um, completely, as Professor Siegel was saying, carry forward the narrative that um, both, you know, he's showing in the engraving, but, you know, um, but other Sons of Liberty are putting out in, for example, their account of the um, of the shooting of the massacre, right? Um, that the the coherence of that story, which is a story that really says, you know, um, Bostonians are the victims here, right? This is the power of an unbridled monarchy that, and this is what happens when you have a standing army that will come and crush the liberties of a free people. That's a, you know, of course that's a standard political line, but that is the line that's embraced by the Sons of Liberty. And so it's hard to imagine that he's doing this without being in conversation at all with the other political people who are thinking in precisely those terms. Right, right. And and at least in in speaking to again Revere, I I, I love this idea as, as you've both alluded to here a bit is as Revere is a, a mixture of the artisan but somebody who is still um, able to get a political message through new you know mediums and 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 new pieces that he's putting out and we can certainly see that both in both in terms of his silver some of his advertisements and and his and you know certainly in, in the engravings um, absolutely. Um, to to the question, and you referenced this earlier as as well, Nancy. I just wonder too if you could, again, um, speak to the actual process of illuminations. That this wasn't something necessarily rare that that Revere himself was doing. Both in, in I would gather, both in Boston and in the context of of the Colonial Seaboard. Oh, absolutely. So the idea of these oil papered illuminations. Um, these would have been the equivalent to, say, um, putting up posters in uh, in your windows. They were means to um, advertise. So the paper would be oiled. Um, it would be um, painted on. The imagery would be painted on and then lit from behind. And so it has this transparency. Um, and so it illuminates beautifully in, in the evening. And it creates this luminous effect. Um, and so something like this for Revere would have been wonderful as a way to celebrate the one year anniversary. And, you know, it's interesting that the type of imagery that he chooses, he's very strategic. Um, and as Dr. Zabin had said, he's fully enmeshed within the social, economic and political society of Boston. You know, if we look at, for example, um, another of his engravings that he does America Swallowing the Bitter Draft, which is a copy of a, of a London version. Um, something like that, the, there's sort of some satirical elements to it. Obviously, the imagery comes from London. But it's so different of when this imagery is produced um, on site in, in Boston of what's happening. Um, and so the very pointed nature and the, I would say, even the way it's described in the newspapers, that's really vivid, the idea of sticking your finger in a wound to try and stop the bleeding. You know, to hear of that also continues that story. It continues that very propagandistic notion of colonists being aggressed upon. And Revere capitalized on that, not only in Bloody Massacre, but I'm assuming that's how it appeared in the Illuminations as well. So if that last window where liberty is there with the liberty cap, Right there's our story being aggressed upon, and somehow coming out beyond that of being saved by liberty. That there's a positive end to this story. Right, and that it very much does have a, a somewhat chronological narrative to how they're how they're actually physically positioned in, in the windows too. And it's it, it is interesting to think about them not certainly today. As we're seeing, these are <laughs> are pretty rare to see in in 2021 um, out of windows, but that maybe would not have have stood out uh, so much as a, as I, I should say as an absolutely unique phenomenon uh, for 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 the period here. 
Um, but maybe by 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 way of of, of closure to the conversation, um, I was wondering if, if if each of you could maybe speak to um, to to what you would perceive either for kind of a, a, a lasting takeaway legacy, either for the illuminations themselves and what Re Revere was doing, or maybe for this this moment as you've referenced, both have referenced, looking back, certainly we know the story, but 1771 always stands out as this, you know, oftentimes perceived as this in-between moment from the massacre to the Tea Party. So if maybe you could either, you know, speak to the illuminations themselves or the 1771 moment, what are maybe some of the, the, the takeaways or the upshots that we should be thinking about collectively for this specific period in history? Uh, so I, I'll start, maybe. Um, I was just going to say for um, for Revere, I think what's so important about the illuminations um, and also relative to things like Bloody Massacre is that it really sets in motion for American artisans and printmakers that there is imagery, there are stories to be told that are going to be made in this landscape, that it's not being imported from England. It's not being told from a different perspective that these are stories that are now generated on this land and are being told and fashioned um, and positioned to really move the discussion forward about what will take place, what, what is going to be the balance, right, between the idea of remaining loyal, words like freedom, independence, which are so charged to begin with, and we think, think about the variety of individuals who are actually living in Boston who aren't free or independent, but I think that for Revere, the illuminations are a way as a memorial to not forget what happened in 1770. That 1771, in many regards, is a beginning, not necessarily an ending to what had happened. And I think just picking up on that, especially that last line, which is great, that, um, you know, the illuminations are a beginning of actually a long process of um, creating commemoration of that moment, right? I, that That is meant to be pretty Janus-based, right? That it's meant to look both um, back towards the event that it commemorates, right? That, that of the Boston Massacre, what comes to be known as the Boston Massacre because of this, and looking forward precisely to the political concerns, right? That are um, becoming increasingly salient first to the Sons of Liberty, and then as they make and solidify this argument to other Bostonians and other people, right? It becomes a more and more general argument. But, you know, this, um, the illumination is in March of 71. And then later, I think in May, is the first of the Boston Massacre um, orations, right, that begins in 71. And then after that, um, the town meeting opens every year on March 5th, and they open with an oration to um, commemorate the Boston Massacre. And that goes all the way really through the war. Um, until it's replaced essentially by July 4th. Um, but that that this moment of the um, March 5th, 1771 illuminations is the beginning of this process of commemoration that solidifies this argument for, that will eventually become an argument for independence. Right, and I think I think that's such a great point to, to close on as well, because in a, in a sense, we're, we're continuing that through this program and certainly a different fashion. But I mean, we have so many of those touchstone moments right now and through this period of the of the 250th anniversaries, broadly construed, certainly we had many last year um, for, for the massacre itself. Um, but we are a part of that process here for the 250th of, of, of the illumination. So I, I do wanna thank you both. Uh, thank you to Professor Serena Zabin, uh, Professor Nancy Siegel. Thank you so much for being here, being a part of this program, sharing your expertise uh, for this uh, rather unique event for the Paul Revere House. Uh, thank you so much for your, uh, for your participation here and thank you all for listening and stay tuned for our next segment. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so we're joined here by artist R.P. Hale, who's done these three wonderful reimaginings 
of Paul Revere's Illuminations from March 5th, 1771. RP, thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks for having me. So we wanted to talk to you a little bit about process and how these came together, but I'll toss it to you first, just in a, a general sense. How did you go through the reimagining process for these wonderful illuminations and how did you ultimately put them together? Well, first off, it was a lot of review of as many pieces of known Revere uh, engravings as I, as I could look at, and there are quite a few out there. Of course, the most famous one is the Bloody Massacre of Boston, which has uh, probably his most extensive style. He was a copper plate engraver and worked as one, and we, we also know he did woodcuts, and he possibly even did wood engraving. So, but, uh, and uh, so I have a similar illustrative style myself as a wood engraver and illustrator and calligrapher. So it was pretty easy for me to take the research, look at his styles, and replicate them as best I could. Um, it's, it's not an out and out counterfeit because some of my own styles have crept in, but the idea is to look at these and say, ah, 18th century. And um, so that there's going to be some conventions followed, like, um, for example, poor uh, Lady America or Lady Liberty, too many illustrations show her with five o'clock shadow. That I was determined to avoid at all costs. So. <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit, I see you've brought some of your, your tools and materials here today. Could you talk about some of the, the items that you used in this process? Uh, yes. Um, if you want 18th century style work, you need to use 18th century equipment. And um, I have, I've been uh, using, I've been drawing and writing with quill pen, real quill pens for over 40 years now. I mean, I don't even think about using them when I'm using them, they just write themselves. And uh, they did the bulk of the, uh, the bulk of the artwork you see here. All the detail, all the shading, all the fine work. Uh, some of the outlines, I was using um, fine pointed brushes, However, my most useful brush, particularly for the copper plate lettering here, was this Japanese sumi brush, because you press down on it, you get a broad line, you let up on it, you get a very thin line. And uh, the other calligraphy, any other calligraphy was, uh, is done by a flat ferrule lettering brush. And so doing these, uh, first off, I, had, I worked with the descriptions that the, the Revere House sent me, which were period. And um, so the first one is, is, you know, about Cider, one of the first, I mean, he was a, he, he died on the 22nd of February, 1770, and which was not long, not that long before the Boston Massacre itself. So we have the descriptions of his ghost rising, demanding revenge. And since he's also holding his hand, trying to staunch the blood, I decided I, he needed to be rising from his body. And um, his friends are sh shocked and dismayed. We also have a paper obelisk in the background. And uh, this would be later on, I mean, Cider is demanding revenge. And just to rub that in, we've got the five victim, five more fatalities of the massacre on March 5th. The second one, foul play, um, that is, taken directly from Revere's engraving, and the hand coloring follows suit. Uh, except to fit this format, I had to compress, I mean, top and bottom was fine. I had to compress left and right to make it all fit. And the third one is America uh, subjugating, you know, putting her foot upon the head of a uh, grenadier in subjugation. This would probably have been the most inflammatory of all because that is out and out rebellion right there. You didn't do that. You didn't show respect for the king, disrespect for the king's agents like that. And in the background, there was a liberty tree, which um, I admit I took directly from his 1765 engraving. And um, so there was a lot, of, they all started out black and white. Um, color back then would be expensive, particularly blue. So you're not gonna use it slavishly particularly on something that's going to be backlit by units of single candle power. They're going to be very dim. And so the coloring was, I took the color, I used traditional colors. I put, applied them 
you know, I selected them for traditional purposes, like the Liberty cap was always red, red coats did not wear purple, and so on and so forth. And blue was one of the colors of freedom. So blue and white. And um, I had to apply them in a way that they would look bright, but that they wouldn't go opaque when backlit. So to, to that point, actually, can you, can you speak a little bit about the process and, and thinking about these actually as illuminated panels? How best did, did you go about making that work for what the setup we have in the Revere House now? All uh, right. Um, the illumination part, first off, since this is the Revere House, 18th century, an 18th century event, it would have been backlit by candles. And so I had to take that into account. So that meant um, picking the colors of blue that would liably not go green when lit with yellow candlelight. So uh, you have to pay attention to the physics as well. Uh, secondly, I did these, since these are gonna be handled rather frequently, I decided to put the odds on our side and do these on frosted draftsman's mylar, which is not an 18th century material, but it's very, very rugged and then backed it up because the mylar was too transparent. I backed it up with a transparent, a semi-transparent tracing paper so that when you do illuminate it, be it by candles or LEDs or what have you, you won't get hot spots illuminating you. You, you won't see uh, the bright spot where the, for the light source itself. So again, physics raises its head. Um, I have taught physics. Uh, particularly, in, and I still teach light, uh, art and science and light and color for physics and art classes, and this is the kind of stuff that you have to pay attention to. Oiled paper is both fragile and hazardous. Um, if it's not stored right, it will spontaneously combust, and we certainly don't need any of that going on. So, use, uh, using modern materials in a period way, and hoping to get away with it, basically. Now, in terms of what Revere was trying to convey here, I mean, you know a good deal about the period, you teach this period as well. From an artist's perspective, what has this process maybe taught, taught you about what Revere was trying to do with these, with these illuminations? Well, Revere was a master of outrage. Um, the, uh, and I have uh, for years you know, mentioned in my US history classes that one of the greatest pieces of propaganda ever in political cartooning was his engraving of the Boston Massacre. Um, the soldiers, okay, they did kill five people. They were provoked. They were backed up into a corner. And um, however, Revere, and by the way, they have also gotten off in trial by none other than John Adams, whose career did not suffer for it, by the way. And so however, Revere put a different slant on it He's got these soldiers callously and deliberately firing and killing gentlemen. By the way, the mob was not composed of 18th century gentlemen. They were uh, basically riffraff. And um, they provoked it. You know, they were born, they did not cease and desist. Uh, brick bats and cobblestones started flying. And the uh, the uh, rank and file fired at the crowd without being uh, without being ordered so by their officer. So whereas Revere here, they're deliberately doing it. Their officers telling them to do it, and all these gentlemen are falling. Um, cider, what was he, eleven or twelve or thereabouts, and um, he was part of a crowd that gathered in front of a loyalist house, and a musket came through the window and and did him in, well, um, what would have been seen as a uh, unruly crowd deserving of the riot act, again, was turned into something else. And um, cider, uh, Cider's Pale Cider was done in a couple weeks before the massacre itself. However, he's still demanding revenge for the five that were subsequently killed by the, by the British soldiery. And uh, this, we're looking at emotion here. And as I said, Revere was a master, was a master political cartoonist. And um, and uh, then finally, we have America bearing the cap of liberty, uh, positioned near a liberty tree, 
um, declaring her independence by putting her foot upon the head of the British Empire in defiance of the king, in defiance of everything. You know, we're going, we're declaring ourselves free, and that's that. And anyone, anyone in 1770 or thereafter who saw this one would know exactly what it meant and why. I mean, we still know exactly what it means. I mean, his, uh, he was that, uh, his uh, political cartoon, cartoonery still applies now, stuff you can learn from. And as a contemporary political cartoonist myself, I have taken quite a bit from uh, Paul Revere, plus the fact that I come from a long line of troublemakers <laughs> in that respect. Well, RP, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for doing these. I think these are, are, are so terrific, and I think they'll be both great for the program and for years to come. Well, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this special evening tonight. Please check out our website where we've posted the transcription from the Boston Gazette, which was used for this program. We also plan to do some special programming with R.P. Hale around his wonderful reimagined panels of the illumination. Be sure to follow us on social media and also check our website for programs that will be coming up this April. This is also a great time to visit the Paul Revere House in person. We're open Thursday through Sunday, 10 to 4, and we hope you'll come for a visit. Thanks again to the Massachusetts Society of Cincinnati for their generous support, to all of our presenters, but especially to R.P. Hale for sharing his extraordinary craft and genius. And a huge tip of the hat to the great team here for their hard work, both in front of the camera and behind the scenes, Robert Shimp, Adrian Turnbull Riley, Emily Holmes, Edith Stablecki, and Kristen Pesca. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.